Good evening. We are dealing now with the specific principles of the infinite way which we are to apply. In meeting the problems of our everyday living, the principles which constitute the healing principles of the infinite way. And I recognize and you must recognize that there is going to be some difficulty about this because most of you have other metaphysical backgrounds. And the principles of the infinite way, the major principles, are not only not the principles of your previous studies, but some of them may appear to you to be very contradictory. And I know that many students do have difficulties because they try to mix the principles of their former teachings with the principles of the infinite way and make no headway or have difficulties in uh, let's call it demonstration the demonstration of harmony last night i explained one of these principles and uh, made it very clear or hoped that i made it very clear that it is probably the most important principle in the message of the infinite way and that is that the nature of God being infinity it is never used for any purpose it is never used for the overcoming of sin disease or death in the infinite way truth isn't used at all The very opposite of that is the truth in the infinite way. We seek to become the instruments of truth. We open ourselves that we may be used by truth, by God. In other words, that God may manifest itself as our individual being, that God may live uh, its life as us, that God may lead, guide, direct, govern, sustain, maintain, support, supply. And we are the instruments through which or as which that takes place. You see, the wisdom of God is infinite wisdom, um, omniscience. Therefore, it is ridiculous to believe that we can tell God or ask God or inform God of our needs. It is an impossibility for us to know more than God. It is only possible for us to know as much as God if we have first known that we know nothing and then let the wisdom of God manifest itself as our wisdom. In other words, by attaining a receptive attitude for the inflow, as I indicated last night, that you would do as a composer or artist or writer, always holding yourself here in, 
inside in a listening attitude almost as a vacuum waiting for the new melody or the new idea or the new vision or the new invention or the new discovery to come to you. <clears throat> this is perhaps best illustrated in the teaching of Zen. And we have it given to us very clearly in a book on Zen in archery, in which it is so clearly taught that the Zen archer learns how to hold his bow and arrow and then stand there waiting until something hits his hand and draws it away from the bow and it flies right off into the heart of the target. In other words, man doesn't aim it, man hasn't the power to hit that center of the target, but merely by holding it and waiting for that influence to open those fingers, the arrow darts right into the heart of the target. So it is when we get used to the idea of being an instrument, both mind and body, in the recognition of the truth that there is a God, infinite wisdom, infinite life, infinite love. And that in our silence and in our stillness, it can manifest itself as us or through us and perform its functions through us. Therefore, we can't use God or truth, but by attaining an inner stillness, God or truth can use us and it can manifest through us as healings if we have chosen the healing profession as inventions if we are inventors, as music if we are composers. God is infinity, and all that is is an emanation of God, whether it is to appear as engineering principles, scientific principles, literary works, artworks, whatever it may be, it must be an emanation of God, and we are the instruments through which and as which it is to function on earth. So you see then that our approach to life is not learning how to use truth, but how to be so receptive and responsive to the divine impulse that truth can use us, that life can flow as our life, wisdom flow as our wisdom. But we know right well it isn't ours, it's God's. Now, since God is infinite, the power of God is infinite, and therefore these discords of the world of which we are so well aware, not only because so many of them afflict us and our families and friends, but because we are aware of them throughout the world. All of these afflictions, discords, diseases, inharmonies, all of these exist in the human scene as experiences due to our ignorance of the basic truth that God alone is power. Now, it isn't your ignorance or mine personally. It is this universal ignorance which instantly takes us over the moment we are conceived and begins to handle us the minute we're born. It isn't your ignorance or mine anymore than any wisdom or power that we would attain is yours or mine. No, 
We come into this world ignorant of spiritual truth. We come into this world accepting the two powers, good and evil. And long before we understand the meaning of them, we have accepted them, and of course we've become deathly afraid of the evil afraid of falling down and afraid of meeting strangers and afraid of automobiles and afraid of about everything there is on the face of the globe until finally we're sent to church to learn how to become afraid of God. Now, <clears throat> the first lesson that we have to learn as students of the infinite way is that the nature of God being infinite, there is no power, no law to anything of a discordant nature, of a material nature, of a limited nature. And uh, in doing this, we learn to resist not evil. We learn to put up thy sword. We learn to stand before every form of pilot and say, oh, you look terrible, you look frightening. And what I hear about you, you're very frightening. But thou couldst have no power over me unless it were given thee of the Father. Now, it isn't a simple matter to come to that state of consciousness because we are born and brought up in material consciousness, and that means in the consciousness of two powers, the good and evil. And we are consciously making the transition from that state of consciousness to the one that is able to look at the crippled man and say, what did hinder you? Pick up your bed and walk. Or Lazarus is not dead, but sleepeth. Come forth, Lazarus, or to the blind man, open your eyes and see. Because there's no power to prevent it, there's only one power operating in consciousness. That power is God. Now, because of our birth, even if we can intellectually accept this as the truth, we cannot demonstrate it until it begins to come alive in us, until an inner conviction comes with it, which comes with practice. And then, of course, we're only able to demonstrate it in a measure. But that is the basic principle. That is the one which gives all students the most difficulty. And many metaphysical students great difficulty because they have been taught that truth overcomes error and how to use truth and of course to get used to the idea that you can't use truth truth is infinity truth is God itself no one can use God no one can influence God no one could sway God no one could uh, get God to do his bidding. We have a chapter in the new book. Is God a servant? And just think, just think if you haven't thought of God, unconsciously of course, as a servant. Telling God your need and expecting God to fulfill it. Telling God what you want and expecting God to produce it. Asking God for this favor or that favor, or even commanding God. As if God were a servant. Whereas the master himself acknowledged himself to be the servant of God. Not a master, but a servant. Then, we come to another principle and all of our healing work is based on this 
And again, to those of you with metaphysical backgrounds, I will say in advance that if you wish to really understand and demonstrate this, you will have to work with it and work hard until you break yourself of your former beliefs and are able to come into the understanding of this principle. Listen well. There is no such thing as personal evil. There is no such thing as evil for which you are responsible. There is no such thing as you are being responsible for any of the sins or diseases or lacks or limitations that come into your experience. It is not your wrong thinking that produced it. It is not your envy or your jealousy or your malice that produced it. It is not your greed or your lust or your mad ambition that produced it. It is not any fault that is to be found with you that produced it. You have no responsibilities for the evils which express themselves in your experience or through you. All oh, this sounds wonderful at this minute. It only becomes difficult when I tell you that neither is your wife or your husband responsible for any of the evils. You see, the truth about you is that you are the child of God. God has manifested its own life as your individual being. God has expressed itself on earth individually as you. The life which is God is your individual life and it's therefore eternal and immortal. Your mind is actually that mind which was also in Christ Jesus, infinitely wise, infinitely pure. Your soul is spotless, and there's anything you could ever do that would change that, because God is your soul. God is your very being, and then we'll take one step further and acknowledge that your body is the temple of the living God. Now this is the truth about you and your life and your mind and your soul and your body and your being. Then why and wherefore all of these discords? Well in ancient days they created an entity called the devil or Satan. And in modern days or later, Paul, who probably, probably didn't like the devil or Satan, called it the carnal mind. And then in our metaphysical language, it has been called mortal mind. Now, it makes no difference which of these names you would like to use. They are all correct. There is a devil. Satan, and there is a carnal mind or mortal mind, which is the source of all evil. Therefore, if you see a man stealing, do not call him a thief. He is just the instrument through which the carnal mind is operating. Regardless of what sin or disease or lack or ignorance. You witness in any individual, please do not condemn them. They are but the instruments through which this carnal mind is functioning. When uh, Jesus was crucified, they blamed some people, some people still blame the Hebrews. Others blame Rome. It wasn't that at all. 
there was the carnal mind, which is anti-Christ, which is anti-everything of God, and uh, which, if it is recognized as power, will destroy you. Now, the mistake originally made was that when it was discovered that man personally isn't a sinner, that there is a tempter called devil or Satan, the mistake that was made was claiming that this devil or Satan was the opposite of God, the opponent of God, and that it was God's function to try to get rid of this devil or Satan. And religion, all down through the ages, has been dedicated to that one purpose, overcoming the devil, and the devil hasn't any power. The devil isn't anything except what we agree to make it. In the same way, the metaphysical world has made the self-same mistake they will tell you in any language that there is no devil or Satan, it's just mortal mind. And then they will invent ways to protect one from mortal mind and have all kinds of quotations and affirmations to overcome this mortal mind and thereby take a licking from it. It must be recognized that all evil is impersonal, comes from an impersonal source, and that source is the belief in good and evil. That is all there is to what is called mortal mind. There is no such thing as mortal mind as an entity. There is no such thing as carnal mind as an entity. There is no such thing as devil or Satan as entity. There is a universal belief in two powers, and that belief itself is the cause of every bit of discord and inharmony that ever existed on the face of the earth. And in proportion as you recognize this, you come back to the example of our two pet examples in this work, the Hebrew Hezekiah, who, when confronted with an enemy twice as strong as his own forces, could say to his people, they have only the arm of flesh. Fear not. Fear not. They have only the arm of flesh. And because they rested in his word and did not take up the sword and go out to fight the enemy, the enemy fought among themselves and destroyed themselves and left all the loot on the battlefield for the Hebrews to pick up. In that same way, the master said, resist not evil. What did hinder you? Pilate, thou couldn'st have no power over me unless it were given thee from heaven. Peter, put up thy sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Then in the degree that you fight or battle this so-called mortal mind, or any of its individual forms and expressions, in that degree will you lose in the end, because you have created an enemy greater than yourself, but one that God can't help you with because God has no knowledge of it. God is too pure to behold iniquity. God cannot. It, was, it, it wasn't the modern teaching of Jesus Christ that ever prayed to God Please overcome my enemies. Please destroy my enemies. Please go out before me and slay these horrible people. It was ancient Hebraic prayers, not Christian prayers. But we indulge them, and we do expect, even in metaphysics, that God, although he's not doing it for the Protestants or the Catholics or the Hebrews or the Buddhists, 
But for us in metaphysics, God will overcome this mortal mind or this sin or this disease. Don't you ever believe it? The overcoming has to be within you. And the overcoming that has to take place within you is your recognition of the truth. I will never leave you nor forsake you. If you go through the waters, you will not drown. If you go through the fire, the flames will not kindle upon you. Why? They haven't any such power. As you realize this, and as you realize the mission and the message of Christ Jesus, you will understand why he could be so big-hearted as to forgive the woman taken in adultery, or the thief on the cross, or Judas who betrayed him. Because he knew, he knew by divine revelation, he knew that these are not power. Crucify me if you want, destroy this body, in three days I'll raise it up again. Certainly, depressions may come and deprive us of our savings, our wealth, our background of investments, but that is only a body of supply. It isn't supply. God is our supply. Therefore, if we lose the body, we start right over tomorrow and uh, build it again. There's no such thing as a limit. There's no such thing as uh, having only one chance or two or three. None of these things. The question is what we ourselves are able to accept of spiritual principles and then practice them until they become living forces within our own being. I realize, of course, don't think that I don't realize how difficult it is to look out at the sins and diseases and horrors of the world and believe that there is no power in them. It is only after you feel within you a certain rightness about that principle and then are willing to put it into practice until such time as you witness really the first healing with it. First time you heal anybody through the realization that you haven't appealed to God to do it or you haven't expected truth to remove error. The first time you have been instrumental in bringing about a healing through the realization Thou couldst have no power unless it were given to thee of God. There is only one power. And are able to rest in that word and then see the enemy destroy itself. See these appearances destroy themselves. Then you say, ah, I have witnessed this principle. I have seen it in action. And then you have the courage to go on and on and on until you are able to do some of the greater works. Now, humanly we have been taught to judge, criticize, and condemn anybody, anytime, anywhere, for anything. As long as it doesn't fit in with our own sense of what's right or wrong. But in this work, you have to change your entire attitude so that you never are guilty of judging, criticizing, or condemning a person, but are always recognizing that the source of whatever it is that is visibly wrong is this carnal mind and it hasn't power if it is someone who is seeking help through spiritual means, they will receive it. But even if it isn't, you still have to take this approach to everyone whom you meet in this life, including the political candidates. That doesn't take from you the judgment as to which man or woman constitutes the better candidate for that particular office. 
but it does prevent you from sitting in judgment on them as a person and holding them responsible for the evils for which some of them at least are guilty. It does help you to remove from them that burden of guilt and sometimes also to free them. Now, <clears throat> these are two steps in our healing practice. Probably three steps, but actually two steps when approaching the healing work. The first step is one which we embody at all times, that is the realization of one power and uh, of not fighting or trying to overcome these negative powers or beliefs or claims that come before us. <clears throat> but the two principles which are used in the healing work are these. First, impersonalization. The moment John Brown asks for help, be sure that you have put John Brown over on the side out of your mind. Don't dwell for one single second on John Brown. And above all, even if you know it, don't believe it. Anything that's evil about John Brown. Dismiss it instantly. Get it out of your thought, and as fast as possible, get John Brown out of your thought. Because your first function in healing work is impersonalization. Remember that word. Impersonalization. This claim is not a person, not a condition, not a thing. belongs to nobody. It's an impersonal activity or substance or imposition of what we might call carnal mind or mortal mind. Get it all back there into that term. Devil, Satan, whatever you like. Impersonalize it. Take it out of the person. See that it isn't a person. It hasn't a person in whom to work or through whom to work. It is an impersonal claim of the universal mind, mortal mind, carnal mind. When you are sure that you have impersonalized it so that you absolutely have no thought of the individual in your mind, then you take the second step, which is nothingizing. And that means you have to go back to Genesis. God made all that was made. All that God made is good. Anything which God did not make, God, anything which is not good, God did not make. Anything which God did not make doesn't exist. Now then, if God made all that was made and all that God made is good, then God didn't make a carnal mind or mortal mind or devil or Satan. And therefore, it has no existence except as a mental concept in the human thought. Now, if you want to know how powerless a human concept is, right now, close your eyes and build the biggest bomb you can possibly build. Build an atomic bomb and combine it with hydrogen and with all the forms of nuclear fission you've ever heard about and now multiply it by a thousand. And now throw it up here at me and see what it can do. Do you understand that? That's a mental concept. It has no substance, it has no law, has no entity, it has no being. It has form. That's why you can see it. But you can only see it in your mind as a mental image. So it is, once you begin to understand that this entire devil is a man-made entity made in the mind of man, not in the mind of God. 
and that it has no law, no substance, no activity, no source, no avenue, no channel, you nullify it. You've recognized it for what it is, temporal power, the arm of flesh, nothingness. And that's where your healing work begins. Actually, regardless of the name or nature of the problem with which you are confronted, you can be assured of this. It's nothing but a temptation of the devil coming to you for acceptance or rejection. And this devil is nothing more or less than this human mind which exists because of a belief of good and evil. Once you have no belief of good and evil, you have no human mind anymore, or mortal mind. You're operating in and through and with the divine mind. It's only as long as there is a belief in good and evil that there is limitation, finiteness, negativeness. Now, <clears throat> often when we are dealing with our friends or our relatives or our patients, we are apt to revert to that human sense of criticism and judgment or the metaphysical sense of saying, well, it's your wrong thinking. Well, there's something in your mind that has to be corrected. Of course there is, but the only thing there is is the belief in two powers. The only thing there is is the same thing that has to be corrected in all of us. The belief that God isn't omnipotence, that God isn't omniscience, omnipresence. But aside from that, that whole theory of resentment calling, causing rheumatism and uh, jealousy causing cancer and sensuality causing tuberculosis, it's a lot of nonsense. And that's all it is, pure nonsense. Because not only the metaphysical practitioners can't prove it, but the psychosomatic medicine practitioners can't prove it. They can claim it and then say, when you get rid of your resentment, you'll be healed. Because they don't know how to get rid of resentment. They don't know how to get rid of the... Uh, negative qualities of human thought that all of us are heir to. You know how. By understanding that these are not personal, but that they are impersonal, and that they are not power, and that they have no law to sustain them. Because of our human experience, we have never been taught, well, of course, we've never been taught. Uh, it has never been heretofore, it has never been revealed that every phase of discord that comes into our experience is a mesmeric influence that we do not know how to protect ourselves from. In other words, when uh, you are in the midst of an epidemic of any disease, you are not necessarily suffering from the disease, but from the mesmerism of the publicity about the disease, and probably there are just as many people dying of that mesmeric influence as of the disease itself in the same way that we know there have been fires in big buildings and more people killed for other reasons than the flames. The flames probably took few lives, but panic, fear, and the lust for life took the rest. Now, 
this universal belief of good and evil operates hypnotically upon any and every individual of this world so that when you leave your home in the morning if you were to think it over you'd have to agree that you have no positive assurance you're going to get back tonight because between the coconuts falling from the trees and the automobiles hitting each other and uh, the lightning and the this and that and the other thing you have become a statistic and so on any morning of the week they can tell you downtown how many deaths there will be by 6 p.m. they just can't tell you who so it may as well be you or me or anyone else we are statistics and every night at six o'clock there must be so many deaths and for this reason and for that reason and so it goes day after day and the question now arises is there a way to avoid this yes there is indeed there is if those who are taught this principle could break through their mental inertia in the morning to the extent of consciously realizing there is but one power operating in this universe it's not a power of accident or death or disease or sin there's only one power operating the same power that is causing the sun to rise on time and to set on time the same power that is causing the tides to be in and out on their time the same power that is bringing fish into the sea and birds into the air that's the power that is operating in this universe that is the power that is operating in my consciousness that is the law unto my experience and uh, there is no power in this mesmeric suggestion of statistics there is no power in this belief of infection and contagion there is no power in the mortal mind carnal mind or any of its forms any of its beliefs individual or collective and watch watch to what degree the ordinary everyday mishaps stay outside of your experience a thousand shall fall at thy left hand and ten thousand at thy right hand it shall not come nigh thy dwelling place who 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 is this thy dwelling place it is the individual who dwells in the secret place of the most high not dwells in a house not dwells in an automobile not dwells in an airplane but dwells in the secret place of the most high and how can you do that it has to be done consciously everything in your life is either an activity of your consciousness expressing itself or your unwillingness to let your consciousness express itself and therefore become a blotting paper for the beliefs of good and evil that permeate the world you either become a blotting paper and take it all in and respond to it and show it forth or else you become master of your fate and captain of your soul but only by an act of consciousness only not by oh well god will take care of it there is no such god there must be an activity of truth in your consciousness and that activity of truth has to be built no matter what form of treatment you give it has to be built around the principle that there is only one power that nothing but god and the activity of god is power and that any sense of evil is impersonal and is nothing but the activity of the fleshly mind or the arm of flesh or nothingness every treatment has to be built around those principles makes no difference whether you're going up in an airplane or down in a submarine doesn't make a difference if you're going to war and you're going to be at the front or whether this is going to be the front from overhead it makes no difference what the nature 
of the human claim is it has to be consciously handled and every so-called treatment or realization must embody those three things the realization of one power not a protection from evil power but the reasoning uh, the, the uh, uh, realized knowledge truth that God itself is infinite and only God is power and every appearance is but this mesmeric influence the temptation of the devil coming to our consciousness to be accepted or rejected and it has to be consciously rejected that's why I said last night that really the one thing the world is suffering from is mental inertia it won't wake up and think it doesn't want to think conscious thoughts wants to look at pictures it doesn't want to give voice to concrete truth it doesn't want to sit back and uh, live with truth it wants to depend on a God it wants to depend on and it's an unknown God and not only that but a God that's failed mankind for thousands of years but it's so easy to sit back and God will do it God won't do anything God is doing and don't ever believe for a moment that God is going to do anything a minute from now that God isn't doing now don't think for a minute that you're ever going to know enough truth that you can influence God to do something for you or for anyone else don't ever think that you're going to be that spiritual that God is ever going to be your servant or going to fulfill your wishes or your hopes or your desires there's no such God God is and God is ising this very second God is being this very second and God is being all that God can be there's no way for God to change God is the same yesterday today and forevermore God is from everlasting to everlasting don't try to get God to be anything or do anything God is but the responsibility is on your shoulders awaken thou that sleepest Christ will give thee light but wake up to the fact that your experience is going to be your own state of consciousness objectified now if you want to lay, lie around all day long just reading books that's probably what you'll exemplify and that's what your life will bear witness to if you insist on going around all day without living consciously in the realization of God omnipresent God omnipotent God omniscient God here and now the all and only power and then impersonalizing all phases of evil and realizing that they exist only as the arm of flesh or nothingness if you won't do that you won't bring harmony into your experience in proportion as you do this and Paul called it praying without ceasing the strange part of it is that for about a year it's hard work because we forget more than we remember and it's usually 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning before we remember how much we have forgotten that we should have been consciously knowing since seven o'clock and then we have to start in at noon to make up for lost time by the time we get into bed at night we've really got ourselves in a jam because we have to get up now to undo all of the forgetting that we have done throughout the day it is a discipline for a year you try just a simple thing make an agreement with yourself that you will never eat a bite of food of any kind or drink a drop of any kind of a drink without consciously recognize that God is the source 
And then count out how many times you forgot that when the end of the day comes around. And then you know how difficult this is. But watch the magical effects in your life if you do reach a place where you don't forget and you do consciously recognize with every bite of food and with every bit of drink that but for God it would not be here. But for God's grace you wouldn't have it. But for God's grace it wouldn't be on earth. But for God's grace you wouldn't have it. But for God's grace you wouldn't be digesting it. Come to the realization that the very trifling acts of your day, waking up in the morning, sleeping at night, cannot be performed without an activity of God, an activity of this invisible spirit, and find out what happens when you begin to acknowledge him in all thy ways. See what happens as you consciously remember when you get into your automobile that God drives not only your car, but since there is only one being, one selfhood, God drives all cars. It is your conscious recognition of this that sets you free from the statistical beliefs. For a year, <clears throat> this is difficult work. Sometimes it may be a little longer than a year. But eventually, something beautiful begins to happen. You don't have to consciously think. These things come to thought of their own accord. They automatically arise within you. And then it isn't long until you really understand what Paul meant. I live, yet not I. Christ liveth my life. After that, then, there's no or very little of this conscious effort. Now it all flows from within. Now it all <clears throat> comes to you. You don't have to go searching after it. The idea is, of course, that we are searching for God in our early experience, whereas uh, no one should ever have coined that uh, term. Because it's incorrect. It's God that's searching for us, and we have to learn to let God catch up. And that's what eventually happens to us. We find uh, that we've just been using a lot of energy that we didn't have to use. If only we'd realized that God is chasing us. Then be quiet and let him catch up. Now let's have a nice rest and move around, do what you'd like.